Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge welcome for our convention keynote speaker, Miss Maria Taylor. I have been having the best time back there hanging out with all of your officers, okay? Um, how many Georgia fans do we have in the house? How many Florida fans do we have in the house? That's what I thought, and if you're a Florida fan, you can look at any of these exits and head on out, all right? I'm just kidding, it's all love in college football. Um, I'm so happy to be here. You know, I was back there talking to some of your officers. I got to spend some time with Nate and Allie, Madison, and the entire group. And they told me that this is the first time in three years that you guys have been able to all come together. And I can honestly feel the energy in this room. So it must feel good to just see your counterparts in one room and be able to celebrate and honor them. And quite honestly, I am so excited that I can be here and be a part of the celebration. So thank you guys for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And I've loved learning even more about FFA. Now, I was looking around, I've been watching you guys come in, and I've been like remembering my middle school days and high school. And maybe you guys don't remember any of this time and it's not happening to you. Um, but I was the most awkward middle schooler and high schooler. I mean, imagine already being 6'2 and a woman. Imagine being called a jolly green giant. <laughs> and imagine never really having the cool kid friends. Like, that was me. Is anyone else in the, the audience like that? Anyone? Oh, good, yes! That's right, guys. It's okay. You can be weird and strange and uncool. It all works out. <laughs> it's interesting because when I look back at when I was sitting in your seat or when I was sitting in your chair, I remember being so insecure and constantly wondering what everyone else was thinking about me all the time. I always wondered if I was saying the right thing, if I was doing the right thing. And I wish to God almost every night that he would just chop off my legs right at my knee and like let me be like 5'2". I'm not even kidding. Me and God have had this talk over and over again. Like if you could just take my shin bone out, I could be the average height of a woman. If you take my ankles out, then I'll at least be able to have a boyfriend in high school. Those were the two things me and God talked about. But now when I look back on it, and I hope that you guys feel this way too one day, my height, the ability to lift weight, my broad shoulders that were broader than anyone else's in my school, my long wingspan, my huge hands. These are like, if you measured my hands for the combine, they'd be bigger than most quarterbacks. They ended up giving me a scholarship to the University of Georgia to play volleyball and basketball. Yeah. So I say that to remind you that the one, two, three, four, or five things that you think are the worst things about you, the most awkward, the things that you want to hide from absolutely everyone, talk to absolutely nobody about it, those are gonna be some of the things that make you the most special, okay? The unique characteristics are gonna be the things that allow you to flourish in a way that no one else can because only you have those characteristics. And all those things I didn't know and understand when I was in high school, or I think I would have been a lot easier on myself. And I hope that I can share that with you guys so that you can know in this moment to lean into that awkward phase. Lean into, oh, well, you know what? I really only like playing video games. Great, one day you're gonna be a person who programs video games. You love ag? Great, lean into that, even if it might not be the coolest thing at school. You might be the person who changes agriculture for the rest of us and saves our planet, helps us save our planet. When I first decided that I was um, going to the University of Georgia, you know, the first thing you have to do is figure out what your major is going to be. So if we have any seniors in the house, you're getting ready for college, and, and you're not quite sure what you want to do, can you raise your hands? Yeah. Been there. I was actually in health science, so we didn't have FFA when I was in school. I'm from Georgia. I grew up in Alpharetta. I went to Centennial High School, so that's all in Fulton County. And we didn't have an ag program, but I did health science. So I just knew for a fact when I got to college that I was going to major in biology and become a doctor because 
that's what you're supposed to do, apparently. That's what all the smart kids do. And then I got to Georgia, and I took biology, and um, I was not good at it, obviously, okay? <laughs> College is a little bit harder than high school. So I called up my mom and dad. My mom's sitting over here in the corner. She could attest to this. I said, hey, mom, I know you and dad thought I was going to be a doctor and make a lot of money and make sure that you guys could retire early, but um, I'm failing biology. So I don't think it's going to work out, OK, guys? So I'm going to change my major, hang up the phone, and I decide that I'm going to change my major to business, right? Because that's the next best thing. If you can't major in biology and become a doctor, then you might as well work in finance or something. So I took my first accounting class. I still don't know the difference between a debit or a credit. And I think I passed the class, but I honestly couldn't tell you. So I picked up the phone again, and I called mom and dad. And I was like, hey, guys, so guess what? <laughs> I'm not going to be a doctor or someone who works in finance that makes you a lot of money and allows you to retire early, but I'm going to figure it out. At this point, I don't even know if they were taking my calls anymore. They were probably like, thank God she's on scholarship, and we are not paying for that girl to be up there wasting our money. So this is my second change. And this time, I decided to kind of sit back a little bit. I had a professor ask me, and she was an African-American literature professor. She said, do you really believe that your strengths will be used for the purpose that you are meant to serve on this earth if you are working in finance? Like, do you honestly believe that? Is that who you're supposed to be? Are you supposed to be an accountant? And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be. She's like, I need you to not answer the question now. Go home and think about it. So after I thought about it, and I spent some time with one of my best friends and my teammate who was in a journalism class, she just was like, come with me, come hang out. I love this class. I think you would too. And it was intro to journalism. And from the moment I walked into that class, I was like, oh my god, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then it clicked to me that it, I could turn the journalism and the broadcasting part of that degree into sports broadcasting because we had people coming to our volleyball and basketball games actually broadcasting the game and getting paid to just talk about sports. And so when I stepped back and stopped trying to force what I feel like the world and my parents and maybe even my friends were telling me was who I was supposed to be and stepped into, wait a minute, this is who I am. I am someone who likes to have conversations with people. I am someone who doesn't mind getting in front of 6,000 people and having a conversation um, in front of FFA, FFA and you guys talk about agriculture and I'm in sports and I'm willing to just stand up here and have a conversation. I like to tell stories. I love to learn more about people, where they come from and how I can express that in a different way. I love writing. And all of these things were true and I knew these things about myself, but I was trying to force myself into, you know, a round hole. I'm, I'm a square peg. I don't fit into finance and I don't fit into being a doctor and so I would have all of you guys think about that like what are the things that you gravitate towards who is the person that when you step forward and you're like that's who I am what does that feel like who is that person when are you most comfortable uh, when do you feel the most like yourself because the last thing you want to do is be a junior in college like I was <laughs> even though it worked out again and you're just, and you're realizing, you wake up and say, I've been trying to be somebody I'm not, and I couldn't even tell you why I was doing it. You guys are going to be so much bigger and better than that. You're already here sitting before me as leaders. You are leaders at your school, just being here for this entire weekend, dedicating your something, yourself to something that's bigger than you, dedicating yourself to something um, that makes you grow, that pushes you. So make sure you lean into that. And don't ever let anyone else tell you what round hole you're supposed to fit yourself into. You are a square peg. You can go anywhere you want to go. You decide what is that other place that you're supposed to be, where you're going to place your strengths. Now, the next thing you have to always be ready for on this wild ride we call life is failure. Now, I know in live television, you guys have probably seen a lot of bloopers. It happens all the time. And maybe sometimes you don't even really notice them, but if I'm calling a game, or if I'm reporting on a game, or if I'm hosting a show, trust me, I know when I'm making mistakes, I'm thinking to myself, dang it, there was one fact or one stat that I really wanted to get out there about Brady and I didn't get to it. Man, there's one little nugget that I wanted to throw in there before we went to commercial break and I didn't do it, I messed up. And then sometimes you're on live television and you make a huge mistake that everybody who's watching knows that you made a mistake. Let me take you back through a time when that's exactly what I did. And it was actually the first time that I did a really big bowl game for ESPN. 
So you guys know about the Rose Bowl, right? Have you heard of it? Yeah? I mean, it's not a minor deal. It's like the most important game on New Year's Day, and you, sometimes the national championship runs right through the Rose Bowl. So I remember it was my very first time getting an opportunity to call the Rose Bowl. In fact, it was my first time doing a game on ABC, and it happened to be on New Year's Day. And I had grown up watching this game with my family, always coming around. It's your New Year's Day tradition. And now I get to call it with Brent Musburger, the legendary Brent Musburger. You guys might be too young to even know who he is, and that's okay. But your mama knows. Okay? Jesse Palmer, The Bachelor. Maybe you guys know he's the host of it now. But he still does college football. And me. And I was like, wait, how did I get here? I'm with The Bachelor and the legendary Brent Musburger. So the whole time leading up to this game, I'm filling myself with this contradiction. It's like, I'm here, but I don't deserve to be here. I'm here, Brent Musburger's here, but I'm not a legend. I'm here and Jesse Palmer's here, but you know, he's had so much other success in pop culture and football and the NFL. That's why he's here, but why is Maria Taylor here? And so I had basically groomed myself to not believe that I was supposed to be there. So we get to the game, and I am a ball of nerves. I've never been so nervous in my career. And remember, up to this point, I've done probably at least 100 football games, college football games. Nothing is different about this one except for the name and the millions of people that have been added on to the viewership because it's a huge game. And we get to the end of it, and Christian McCaffrey at the time was still playing at Stanford. They had just crushed Iowa by like 50 points. He had set a Rose Bowl record for rushing, and he had just lost, came in second place for the Heisman, and a lot of people thought he should have won the Heisman, so this is his first time having a conversation since he lost the Heisman. And Brent Musburger throws down to me, and the first thing that I say is, well, how do you feel about your um, productition on the night? And productition, guys, is not a word. I, I didn't say um, production. I didn't say the word productive. I said productition. So if you look that word up in the dictionary, you're gonna find nothing because it doesn't exist. It's not a real word, okay? And everyone who was on Twitter and watching the game that night was like, who the freak is this girl who can't even spell or read or speak English at all? Because a lot of the people who were watching the game, it was their first time even seeing me for this. Like, it was the first time. And I had made up a word, I'd fumbled over my word, and I thought to myself, well, that's it. They're literally never gonna give me another game again. I'm never gonna have the opportunity to do this thing we call sports broadcasting because in the biggest moment, on the biggest stage, with the biggest opportunity, I fell flat on my face. So, you know, all you can do after that is get on Twitter because, you know, that's what you do. I read all the tweets. I kept stabbing myself with those tweets and those, those harsh words. Eventually I got on and tweeted something funny like productition and then I defined it. I was like a level of productivity that has absolutely no explanation, i.e. Christian McCaffrey in the Rose Bowl. And so that was my tweet afterward to let everyone know, haha, I'm making fun of myself. I didn't mean to do it, but you know, let's all have fun with this situation. And then I went to my hotel room and I cried. <laughs> And when I say I cried, I mean, I had a full-blown panic um, slash crying attack for like 24 to 48 hours, we'll say, okay? Not ever a dry eye for me. Now, the good thing about this situation was my mom, again, who's here today, she was there with me, and uh, eventually she looked at me and was like, girl, if you don't stop crying, I'm gonna give you something to cry about. <laughs> and y'all know that I don't want any of those problems. <laughs> And she was just like, no one cares. Like, you're not that important. No one's at home right now thinking, remember when Maria said that one word that didn't make any sense? Like, oh my God, she still doesn't deserve to be on TV. No one cares. So, although that's a hard pill to swallow coming from your own mother, I did digest it. And I realized that there's a lot of truth in that tough pill to swallow. The reality is when we start to think that we are bigger than this whole wide thing that we call the world, that's when we can get self-centered, caught in our own minds, get obsessive about the small things, sweat those super small things. And then I remembered all the ways that I was talking to myself before the Rose Bowl game about how I didn't belong there. 
And I realized that I set myself up for that. I told myself I was gonna fail. I had such a paralyzing fear of failure that I made myself fail. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I ask you guys, what are the times or the ways in which you guys have created your own self-fulfilling fear process? When have you set up the own philosophy for yourself and you've caused yourself to fail flat on your face? You don't have to do that. You can feed yourself positivity. You can tell yourself that you belong. You can tell yourself you're gonna do great on the test. You can tell yourself uh, that you're gonna have a great time here at FFA. And that's what I took from that moment. And then flash forward to when the University of Georgia is playing Oklahoma at the Rose Bowl. Yeah. And yours truly is on the sidelines. We all were able to watch the double overtime game as Sony Michelle ran up the sidelines, scored the final touchdown for Georgia, down the Sooners and their Heisman winning quarterback and went on to the national championship, right? Do you remember that game? That was the first time in Rose Bowl history that we had a double overtime game and I got to be the one holding the microphone, asking Herbie Smart how it felt to make it to a national championship game in Atlanta after being in the Rose Bowl. And he looked at me and he was like, well, girl, feels good. How do you feel? Go dogs, right? <laughs> and I tell you that because that's the same place where I fell flat on my face. And then four years later, it's the place where I experienced the greatest joy. And my dad called me as soon as the game was over and he said, how funny is God that he brought you back to the same place where you thought your career was gonna end and gave you the highest high you could ever feel working in that industry. So don't ever believe that your failure is final. There's nothing final about it. All you can do is learn from failure and grow. And I promise you, your God, your higher power is gonna bring you back to that spot and he's gonna test you. And if you're ready, you're gonna succeed. And that's what I hope you guys all take from my failures. And if not, at least you know that productition is not a word, okay, ladies and gentlemen. Now the last story I wanted to get to and make sure that you guys heard was the story of me going from just being a sideline reporter who did high school football, college football, to someone who was working full time at one of the leading networks in sports. But to do that, I gotta take you back to a decision that I had to make. I was at a crossroads, right? I had an opportunity to go to the SEC network or stay where I was and continue to basically do individual games. I was working in women's basketball, doing a little sideline reporting in high school and college football, and that was my comfort zone. It felt good, I was making pretty good money, and then an opportunity came on to go to SEC network, but that was gonna stretch me all. I had never been a host before in my life but I really, really wanted the opportunity to one day be like, I could host football night in America, which is what I do now, right? <laughs> but I, I, I had to figure out, okay, so what do I do? What are the steps that I need to put forth? Like, what do I have to do to line myself up with this goal that I have in front of me? And I had to get out of my comfort zone. I was going to have to take this job that allowed me to host. So that would mean going to SEC Network. Now again, when I tell you, mom was there. <laughs> Parents, are you guys getting the gist that I'm, I'm turning 35 this year, my mom's still here, like it's not gonna end anytime soon if y'all are in the stands, okay? It's not ending, y'all are here for the long haul. But I was so sick to my stomach every single time that I had to go and audition for the SEC Network, I couldn't eat for a straight week. I worried myself to death. Then I did end up getting the job and I could have done all that without putting all the pressure and negativity on myself. I accepted the job, and then my mom and I decided, okay, we gotta go to Charlotte and find out where I'm gonna live, where I'm gonna stay, and since I'm taking this job, it's gonna be my first time moving away from my parents. And you know, some of you guys, if you're in high school, it's gonna be your first time moving away, and you don't know how you're gonna react. Let me tell you how not to react. This was how I reacted. We went and looked at an apartment in Charlotte first, and I was like, oh, it's okay, but no, that's not really wanna, where I wanna stay. Getting more and more excited. We ride to a condo where I'd have to sign, well, you know, I'd have to get a mortgage and like buy a house, it was a real condo. 
And I was like, I think this is what I want. This is what I want to do. I want to buy a condo in Charlotte. Then my mom and I went to go eat immediately afterwards, and I went to the bathroom, and I start sobbing, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry a lot of my stories involve crying, but I'm an emotional child, okay? I was bawling crying in a, like, subway shop restaurant, or bat restroom, crying my eyes out because for the first time, I was leaving my entire support system, and I walked back outside, and my mom was like, what are you crying for? <laughs> And I told her, I was like, I don't think I want to move here. I don't think I want to take this job. I don't really know what I'm doing. Like, what did I say yes to? Like, I don't even know. What is an SEC network? It's the first time they're ever having it. Like, I'm giving up this job I understood and I knew. And she was like, get in the car. <laughs> so we go get in the car and we drive back to the apartment. She's like, you have to sign this lease. You have signed a contract to work for the SEC network. And I'm, t guys, when I tell you I'm crying the whole time, I'm crying the whole time. And she's like, you know what, no, we can't go back to the apartment with you like this. So we go to the mall, which is not too far, 15 minutes away, to get me sunglasses to put on. So as I'm crying like a baby, the landlord doesn't see me crying so I can sign the lease. My mom didn't want her to think I was like kidnapped and signing a lease against my own free will. So now I'm walking around with shades like, yeah, this looks great, thank you, yeah. I think I'll take this one, the three bedroom, I guess that's great. And I signed the lease. And then we're riding back home to Atlanta, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard this song, but it's by Paramore comes on, and still to this day when I hear it, I die laughing. Um, but the chorus kind of goes like, don't go crying to your mama, cause you're on your own in the real world. And the whole thing is about like someone leaving the nest and having to start out in the real world. And here I was sitting next to my mom crying about starting my life in the real world. And we just laughed and laughed and laughed about that in between me just crying and crying and crying. But I think now when I look back on it, it was me kind of stepping into again who I am. There was so much fear and pressure that I had put on myself that I had to break through to get to the next level. So I tell you that story to one, let you know that it's okay to cry. I do it a lot. But two, it's okay to feel as though you are about to get outside of your comfort zone. You don't know what's coming next and you're a little bit afraid of that. Because honestly, if that's where you are in your life and those are the steps that you're challenging yourself with, you're probably moving in the right direction. I have never taken a job. I have never moved into a new role whether that's working with the NBA, working on college game day, leaving, going to NBC, working on the Olympics, now working on Football Night in America, going to the Super Bowl, without having a little bit of a fear of, you know what, I haven't really done this yet. It's outside of my comfort zone. Can I do this? And then I look back and I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah, I got this. So I just want you all to leave here knowing that no matter what you are about to embark on, yeah, you got it. You can cry, you can talk to your mom, you can be full of fear, you can wake up and realize that everything's gonna be okay, but take that next step, challenge yourself, walk in what, who you are, and stay positive throughout the entire thing, because you deserve that, okay? Continue to work hard and challenge yourself. And since this is day one of FFA, and it's the first time in three years that you guys have all been together, can you just get up and scream for me? Because you deserve to celebrate the fact that you are all here. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You guys are amazing. Have an incredible time here in Macon and enjoy this entire weekend. Miss Taylor. Thank you for joining us here tonight at the 94th Georgia oh. FFA Convention. I make Allie hold my hand. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here tonight at our 94th Georgia FFA Convention. Your words have truly shown us the importance of accountability and have inspired us all. Thank you again for everything that you've done for those around our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up one more time for our convention keynote speaker, Ms. Maria Taylor. Thank you.